Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering whether I should beat Patricia up for putting me between you and morning tea. But, um, so I'll, I'll do my best to, to get through this. Um, which bit of this clicker do I press? The, the, the error. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing in the core curriculum in relation to this material, um, and particularly in first year. Um, and um, many of the, the issues with law reflect what, um, what Craig and Richard have already told us about how professionals respond. Um, we, we used to look at the US studies to find out what was, what was wrong with law students, and then we thought, well, law students are a bit different in Australia from how they are in the US, so a number of Australian studies have now been done. And despite the differences in the way the education's carried out, the results are very similar. Um, why that is, people have a range of... Actually, I'd rather have the light on, if you don't no, mind. No worries. Because you wouldn't like me to go to sleep during this. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you'll still be able to see well enough. Um, after all, I think I'm the person that's most important here. <laughs> um, so the Brain and Mind um, survey showed a significant level of depression and, and anxiety amongst law students, solicitors and barristers, um, and this was the disabling levels of depression. That's, that's worse than in the general population, but as you know, we have a general epidemic, really. Um, so, and similarly to medical students, when law students arrive in law school, they feel terrific um, because they've done so well. It's so hard to get into law school in Australia. Um, and, and looking at our own um, UNSW law students, you know, they've had to get some ridiculous ATAR or UAI or whatever it is, like, what have they got to be? 99.7 to get into the course. So they feel terrific. Unfortunately, when they get here, they're with a bunch of other people who also got that. And, and so that is one of the first things that causes trouble for them. Um, so we know that within that first year, a quite high proportion begin to show high levels of depression. Now it's really important when I'm talking to the law students about this that I'm clear to them that this doesn't mean that they are doomed. So, um, it's, it, so I'm sort of constantly running this double, double line, you know. There is a disproportionate effect and you do need to be resilient but doesn't mean that just because you're a law student that's the end of your life. Um, okay, so what we did you won't be able to see this very well. Um, maybe I'll get you to turn the light off just for this <laughs> moment. So we did a survey. Um, it was in 2005. And we, can, we wanted to look at what was going on in the minds of law students and, um, and other cohorts to see if there were differences across the different faculties. So this was a study of 3,000 students who did surveys across UNSW. And we compared law students with medical students, with commerce students, with architecture students, etc., across the different faculties. Um, and we, what we were doing was not asking them about their levels of depression or anything like that. I was more interested in trying to work out if there were attitudinal markers that would um, tell us. And actually, here I should declare that my first two degrees were in psychology, so which might actually explain some of this. Um, so I was more interested in this, at this stage in looking at these attitudinal markers to see if they were having, um, if there were things that we could point to that seemed to make sense in terms of the literature on depression and the causes of depression and that would tell us something about law students. And so this is what we found. I think I've been trying to be a bit too clever here, but anyway. Is there a... No? Okay. So... Yeah, well, I was trying to find the one. I don't know. I can't see what works as the pointer. Anyway, look, the things that are important are, are these findings. And what we found was law students compared to every other faculty. We thought we were going to find that law students and medical students were pretty similar. Um, because there are so many um, similar things about the way they get into their course and the, the demands on them. And that's what we thought we were going to find. But we didn't. What we found was that the law students, compared to everybody else, were disproportionately likely 
to have these, some of these factors. In some of them, they were more similar to medicine than others, but there was still this disproportion, even compared with medical students. So the first one was, and this is really important, they are doing their course for a reason that was external to themselves. In particular, because their mother or father or their somebody said to them they would, and secondly, because they got the mark. So those two reasons, very big. Um, they didn't find their studies intrinsically interesting. I find this absolutely staggering, because I think it's incredibly interesting, but uh, clearly they, that's a disproportionate problem for them. They're very concerned that employers are not interested in anything about them except their marks. So they have this view that employers are not interested in their, their personal or social characteristics. Um, they hate group work more than any other group. Um, this is really interesting, and it's also one of the reasons we do lots and lots of group work with students. Um, they just like to break that down. Um, they value the reputation of their university more than other students do. Um, they're less likely to say they're at university to learn, and um, they are um, very likely to see their friends in terms of useful networks. Um, and then they're very, very focused on marks. So um, those things, uh, information that we that we give to the students in in the lecture that in the course that I'm going to tell you about, we give them that information, and it's very interesting to see how they respond to to this set of characteristics and how very many of them say, "Oh my God, that's me." Um, so I then talk to them a bit about two major issues. One is, if we went back to that previous slide, you'll see that there's a little marker, don't leave it, leave it off. There's a little marker that says A or SC in relation to each of those. That marker is, A stands for autonomy, because I think it's an auto a factor to do with autonomy, which is one of the big issues for depression. And the other one is social connected. So SC, and so we talk about how those factors might be going to those sort of issues. We can't talk about some of the others, some of the other things that are important for depression because um, it's just not appropriate for a law school. So we focus on those two factors. Okay. All right. So what we do? Well, first of all, we have to persuade students that it's useful for them to take some note of these contemplative practices. There's clearly some initial resistance. Um, th this is basically how we do it. Um, the first thing is we assess it. Having seen all that evidence about how much they think marks are important, the only way to make them think things are important is to assess it, so we assess it. Finding ways to do that is critical. Giving them really solid evidence, so this just, me actually, I think this actually reflects almost entirely what you were saying about the way to, um, oh, I hope it does, because it suggests that we do. We time the material that we do so that it fits in with when they're getting assessments and so on, so that we can give them some experiences of, of uh, the stress release pro per usefulness of, of some mindfulness things, just when they're very stressed about an upcoming assessment or something. Um, and very much a matter of contextualising it so it's meaningful for professional practice. And for law students who are really keen on talking about litigation, being in court, and, and in particular, their favourite form of assessment is to be, is to, or their favourite form of activity is to do a moot, which is like a, um, it's like an appellate court argument. So there's no question about facts, it's all about law, um, and they just love that. And, uh, the more of that you can give them, the better. So showing them that it's really useful for mooting and litigation is the way we make our way into their hearts and minds for this, for this purpose. Um, so what we do. First of all, just a little bit of context about how UNSW law works. Um, so in first year, all classes are under 30. Um, the students have a teacher. They're all taught seminar style, so they always have required reading, which they must do before they come to class. They are marked on their class participation. The class, participa the, class participa <laughs> the class participation mark is a mark for engagement, not for mastery. And that's a very important point. 
um, because the point is to make the class a place where you can take some risks without um, feeling like it's very dangerous. So what we're interested in is their effort and involvement and that's what they're being marked on for class participation. What this also means is they meet twice a week for two hours each time, which means that their teacher gets to know them very, very well. So I have, at the moment, I have a, a one first year class. I know all the names of my students. I know what they're interested in. I know what they like and so on. Um, and that's a very important part of what we're doing. We also have the occasional lecture. Um, and one of them is the mindfulness one. Um, now this lecture, I have to say here that I none of this might have happened a little bit, but it certainly wouldn't have happened if, in the same way if, if I hadn't met Patricia. I don't even know how that happened. <laughs> anyway, so Patricia's been an integral part of this project and trying to bring this into all the work we would, we've been doing on resilience for law students over the last little while. Um, so what we do is there is a we have a lecture to the whole cohort, which is which Patricia and I do together, where I present a lot of the stuff about law. Patricia gives them a lot of the evidence and the background about how contemplative practices are useful and helpful um, and how they interact with cognition and so on. Um, so that's giving them some evidence. They really don't like touchy-feely stuff. So um, we are very, very hard-edged in that lecture, except right at the end we give them Patricia gives them a little exercise um, to, to, um, to give them just a taste um, because many of them have absolutely no background in this and really are only there because it is assessed. Um, so we, we're looking at those particular advantages in particular. Um, what we're interested in is the one of the themes in our curriculum is the development of personal and professional um, Set, um, management and skills. In first year what we say is that what we're interested in is the beginning of a development of personal and professional identity and for the students to begin to recognise how those two things interact, which means they need to focus on their own values. And we also point out to them that it's very clear to us that law students and lawyers, very often the tipping point for them either into depression or into leaving the profession or law school is when they meet an ethical problem. So ethical problems are the tipping points for our students. So Justine over there who teaches our course called Lawyers, Ethics and Justice, um, she follows on from us in, in emphasising this, this material. Um, what we're interested in them developing a sense of their own values, their own ethics, learning to articulate arguments about their own values and ethics which they can then use in relation to clients, learning to articulate the legal values and ethics and knowing for themselves how those interact and where they may be in conflict and having already articulated to themselves the problems that they might be dealing with. So we're actually doing something quite, we're trying to do something quite ambitious um, and a central part of it is actually the, the notion of mindfulness. Um, and so what we're really trying to do is show them um, that, that um, the development of a good lawyer, because what we're interested in is not just the development of lawyers, but the development of good lawyers, and in particular, um, recognising that not all of our students will be lawyers, so they need their personal and their professional, whatever that profession is, development thought about. We go through these things. Just, um, we also do, so we have the big lecture, and then in class, um, I have been running a particular program where every, every, every second class I spend five to ten minutes talking about issues to do with mindfulness, how they're going in the course, how it fits, how they're finding, how they're feeling and getting them to reflect on the process. Now the assessment, um, I'm not quite pleased with how we've done this. The court observation, when am I supposed to finish? 11.15. I'll give you five minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, because like all lawyers, I can talk under wet cement, so I have to be kept under control. <laughs> the court observation assignment, this is the first thing they ever do. They do it in the first three weeks of session, and they are sent out to the courts. They go and they have a look at all the um, students. They have already had their, their big lecture. They've already had to read the chapter in the book which discusses the modern lawyer. 
um, they go out to court and they're just supposed to write basically a reflective exercise on what they saw, what they observed, how it fits in with what they know about the possibility of these lawyers, judges, whatever. Are they, do they have a sense of themselves as a professional? Do they seem to have strategies for dealing with really um, tricky, ethical or stressful issues? And in fact, what's really interesting here is that they go out, they come back and they've seen masses of stuff that they can talk about. They've seen a judge um, yell at a lawyer until the lawyer was in tears. They've seen um, the client, you know, clients and, and lawyers dealing with each other when the lawyer's trying to explain to the client something the client's clearly having difficulty understanding. They've seen all these things. Um, so I think actually they get a very good sense from that, that that there is something in this and then we can follow that up further. We then have an essay in the exam at the end of the course which also um, requires them to talk about what they think, how they think metacognitive um, ideas are useful in legal practice, some variation of, of that sort of thing. Okay, so the topics covered are these ones. Um, I think I've already talked about some of them. In my view, when they're thought, thinking about their need for resilience, I think they need very much to be talking about an autonomous and ethical sense of self. And the reason that mindfulness is being um, suggested as one of the best ways of doing it is that it allows you to sit, it allows you to look at whatever it is you're looking with total attention. It can all, and we also are very focused on, on the, the sort of later development. If you, if you do mindfulness practice for some time, you become able to stand back and become more able to recognise, to see your responses, to stand back from them and evaluate them and then respond in a way that may be more appropriate than your initial response to whatever happened was. This is really important in things like litigation where it is re quite common for lawyers, I mean, I don't, most of you aren't lawyers, but in fact I know a number of lawyers, you know, big, strong, hulking men who've burst into tears in front of the High Court. You know, it's a serious because they really get hammered by the judges. And the ability to withstand that sort of thing, to look at it and realise that what's coming to you is really their problem rather than yours and that what you need to think about is which bits really belong to you and which bits belong to the judges or whoever's doing that is extremely important. Um, um, yes, so I think I've... Um, how about that? So I've already talked to you about how the assessment works. I, I guess one thing that is important about that is that this assessment, this first assessment, is not worth very much, so they can't, they can't sort of damage themselves with it. And it's also supposed to operate as a, diagnost, as a diagnostic tool. So we actually use this assessment to do a whole range of things, um, not just the, the mindfulness thing. And, and, and because I know my class quite well, I can speak individually to particular students about these things. What I haven't said there, but I did write a little note to myself back forward, is that this is being done with no money. No money. I mean no. You know, that round thing? <laughs> Zero. So, and this is, this is a problem, and I think this is a problem that many people have. Um, is that they're trying to put things into curricula that are already jammed, mm -hmm. that um, are really, um, that are already very demanding, and what it has required is for Patricia and me, in this case, to actually do extra ourselves. Um, what, what I want to do is create a situation where this becomes so embedded in the curriculum that it doesn't depend on me or Patricia being here. Um, you know, I, I will die sometime. I'm willing to recognise that because I'm a succession lawyer and I specialise in wills and <laughs> estates. So I'm happy to recognise that I will die. So I want this in, in place firmly in a way that won't, um, that won't need, need me um, as soon as possible. Now, what is interesting about this is that we used, we got these students, so this is my next thing, that we did get feedback. So. We didn't have time to go down the ethical, um, what do you call that? 
going to the ethics committee. Yeah. Just takes so long and I can't bear it. Um, and, and, you know, it's certainly developing my subversive instincts in a big way. Um, so the point is that we needed some feedback. feedback. How are we going to get the feedback? How are we going to work out? what? Well, we could get feedback for teaching purposes, so that's what we've done. Um, okay, two ways. One is just people coming up and talking to you. Um, I've been very surprised, really, at the extent to which students listened attentively in the lecture um, and in class. And also that when, when, when Patricia's done the exercise, they've done it. They haven't um, sort of gone, <laughs> which is what I thought might have happened. Um, that has not happened. And there are common responses where they come up after the class and they say, have said things like, I found the lecture comforting. I think that's amazing. Um, a lot of them said things like, I recognise myself and in this and, and maybe I'll, I'll try this. Um, and there's been quite a lot of recognition in their feedback about ethical values and the recognition of um, the need for autonomy in dealing with what can be a difficult profession to be in. We also, um, one class was asked to actually do a Moodle feedback, a Moodle feedback session. So Moodle's our thing like Blackboard or whatever, depending on what people have. Um, and I've just taken a few of the responses out. They were quite long responses. Most of them were a page or so on. So they actually got right into it. Um, and I think it's very interesting to see Although I put these up and they're in quite small um, writing, it's interesting that this first one um, says, um, I think it can be observed that choosing to study law and the nature of the work would mean that one was somewhat motivated to help others. Um, but the point, the point that, that I notice in here is that this student then goes on to say, we should maintain both these internal, authentic motivations um, and a desire to be part of a profession seeking to entrench justice. They're, very, they're still very idealistic in first year. We're trying to maintain that, trying to maintain the idea of law as a service profession. That's always been the orientation of this law school and this course in first year is when we really get a chance to embed that. So it's really nice to see that this is, is, is here. Um, what I took away from the lecture um, was the importance of developing and staying true to my own ethical compass. Um, I, I'm very, I mean, I'm really glad to see responses like that because I think that actually does offer um, a real hope in, the, in respect of, of the legal profession going back to its professional roots in a way that I, I think that it's been something that I think it's been losing. They also, the next one says, um, it goes on to say, I'm really glad I went to this metacognition lecture seeing the system that not only UNSW but other universities around the world, so we talked to them about other programs, um, are starting to put in place to encourage and help people to learn to be aware of their mental state um, and how to deal with potential difficulties was very heartening. Um, and then the next one is most people would have recognised a few of those negative characteristics um, in themselves. Um, it honestly made me feel quite guilty However, it's a learning exercise and I can try to change the way I, um, I view things. Um, what Prue said about finding internal motivation, self-evaluation, self-monitoring, self-set ethics and meaning um, is important. And then um, there's somebody who's talking about how they recognise the benefits um, and is saying, well, maybe I'll try it. And then what I learned from the lecture was to develop your personal and professional identity means to break out of this mould and understand how your own ethics and attitudes can interact with the legal system. So I, I think these, you know, while recognising that to some extent they um, they uh, they know they've been given this stuff so that they're supposed to be positive about it, so taking a somewhat um, slightly um, sceptical view of, of the responses, but at the same time knowing that when I ask students to do this, they're quite happy usually to say, you shouldn't have done any of that group work because I didn't like it and I don't think I learned very well. So they're usually quite frank in their, in their responses. And I think, um, so I think that's quite, um, I think it's quite encouraging to see this 
the, the response of the students. Students are very aware of being stressed. Um, they're, quite, they're quite clear about that. Um, so it's good to see that when we actually offer them um, <coughs> something. Now, we're, offering, we're not offering them very much, though. I hasten to emphasise, we are not offering them as much as, as Monash is offering those students, because what we're doing is trying to, to lever something into a program that's already um, extremely full without the benefit of any, um, of any, any funding to help with it. And truly, I mean, in the current environment, I don't see any funding coming soon. I think it's a rather depressing period to be in universities. And, um, but hopefully, and, and one more thing I wanted to say is what we haven't done yet and what I'd really like to see happen is that I think the most stressed people in the universities are actually the academics. And, and I'm so glad to see that Monash has got academics involved. I think academics actually very much need more of this kind of thing for themselves. So I think I've left two minutes, which is probably quite good, so I probably won't be killed before morning tea. So, questions? Yes? You mentioned that um, ethical problems were the, the major trigger for shifting it for depression and practitioners and leaving the course. Could you say a bit more about that? Where's, where, how did you get that information? And what? Um, that information is, the literature in legal education is quite explicit about that. Um, so we're aware of that. I have the anecdotal evidence that I'm getting, you know, there are two things that pe make people leave legal practice. One of them is the six minute billing process. Um, but, but it's quite clear that many people say, I saw a client, my, 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 my partner asked me to do something that I knew was unethical and, and I thought, how can I go on doing this? I just cannot do it anymore. Um, the, the, ethical, eth ethical, the ethical quandaries are not things like appearing for murderers and things like that. That's not really an ethical quandary. The ethical quandary is things like being asked to sign a document to say that you, that somebody, somebody act, to witness a document saying that somebody signed it um, when you witnessed it, when in actual fact they, they didn't witness it in front of you. Um, those sorts of things can be insidious and ongoing um, and in actual fact to maintain that kind of professional ethics thing is significant. But the other thing is people who are in firms where they feel that they're constantly acting for somebody, a, a business or a person that is actually just bullying people, people feeling that they're being put in a situation where the, um, the actual law itself is wrong and they, they don't feel that they can support it anymore. That's very common um, and certainly that's a very big reason why people leave very large law firms and move to very small ones um, or into private practice. So it's, it's that sort of thing rather than the one that most people think is the big ethical dilemma for lawyers, like how do you appear for somebody who's a really bad person. Now that's not actually the one, it's more these systemic um, things in practice. I mean, actually, Justine might be better able to answer that than I am. Uh, Justine? Yeah, well, you know, as you say, the, the kind of classic, you know, defending a, a guilty, per potentially guilty person, that's the, they can rationalise that the easiest because it goes the closest to that kind of constitutional arbiter on the last bastion between the individual and the state. That's the, it's the other stuff that's, that's much harder, as you say, because ethics is completely tied up with well-being, autonomy, competence, connectedness. Um, had to pull it all apart, but yeah, yeah, the literature is basically either an ethical issue or a well-being issue, meant I don't prefer, but they're closely actually. Yeah. Okay. I think we might need to leave it there. Um, so thank you very much, Prudence.